Okay then, well, hello, hello everybody. Um, hello, it's, um, it's getting to that, uh, that bittersweet moment in the semester when we start winding things down here at the Humanities Center. And this is indeed the penultimate session in our series on the desert, which is very sad. Uh, my, my sadness, on the other hand, is ameliorated by the presence here of an absolute dream panel consisting of three great colleagues from uh, USD's College of Arts and Sciences. And they're gonna address in their own very various ways, aspects of the desert and our time. So I'll just say a brief word of introduction to each in alphabetical order. Marnie Lafleur is Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology. She received her PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder and is a specialist in primatology and biological anthropology. Her research focuses on the evolution of female dominance in lemurs, in addition to the trafficking of endangered species. And this long-term research is conducted at a remote forest field site in southwestern Madagascar. In an undertaking very much related to today's session, Dr. Lafleur hosted in Copley Library an adapted version of Hostile Terrain 94, a participatory exhibition created by the Undocumented Migration Project, visually charting the deaths of undocumented migrants on the California border. Antonieta Mercado received her PhD from UC San Diego in, and is Associate Professor in the Department of Communication and Director of the Program in Latin American Studies. Her multifaceted research includes investigations into transnational communicative practices, civic advocacy journalism, indigenous migration, and grassroots cosmopolitanism. And her work on these subjects has been published in multiple journals and essay collections. In addition to this uh, academic work, Dr. Mercado is an artist who has organized and curated Day of the Dead altars and community events in the San Diego region since 2004, organizing a yearly altar at the University of San Diego since 2019, doing a splendid series of programming for the Humanity Center in those heady days before COVID. And our third speaker is Alejandro Meta, Professor of Spanish and Chair of the Department of Languages, Cultures and Literature. He received his PhD from the University of Pittsburgh and his specializations include the Jewish experience in Latin America, immigration and the politics of memory. In addition to his academic publications, which have appeared in such venues as Hispania and the Latin American Research Review, Dr. Meta is an acclaimed photographer whose work includes portraits of Latin American writers in a variety of contexts, including the US-Mexico borderlands. His work has been exhibited in the United States, Mexico, and Argentina. So, uh, speaking with us today on aspects of border crossings, please welcome Professors Lafleur, Mercado, and Meta. <laughs> Okay, nice to see all of you. Um, I'm, I've had one of those days where it's like I'm on the edge, like I'm totally frazzled because I was late for everything and I showed up for an interview and it was on camera interview and it was like just, it's my whole day. I got here and I didn't have my presentation and that's where I'm at. So I'm taking it down, I'm just gonna roll with that. So this is a image of where I work in Southern Madagascar. And I think because all, many of you are here and have been attending this series, we probably share a love of the desert. Um, we find joy in the quiet. We find treasure in the barren. And we find meaning in the stark. Um, the self-portrait, doing some field work. Um, so this is what much of my experience in the desert is like. This was my transect. Um, so have fun with that. Um, but I managed some more images of the field site where I work. It's very dry. It receives less than 200 millimeters of rainfall. 
um, and several years out of a decade tend to be droughts. And this is the reason these critters are why I go all the way there. Lemurs are unusual in that they have female dominance in mammals. <laughs> Do you like lemurs? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's really strange. And so I've spent um, much of my career studying them. And if you can just imagine this, the forest just goes on forever. And to be out there, to be out there, especially alone, which is not really safe, so I shouldn't do, but to follow my lemurs for a day or a month or whatever, all by myself, it's quiet, just to learn what their whole life is about and get, not physically, but get um, um, figuratively lost out in the desert with these animals is really wonderful. And I don't have anything to say about this photo. I just wanted to show it to you because I just think they're amazing. This is how they can live in this desert is that there's underground water. Um, it's hyper saline and not very friendly to people, but the lemurs are able to, um, to consume it. And that's how they live in this desert. So this is my, has been my experience with the desert. And so I'm here to talk about something very different today. Um, the, a different kind of desert, the American Southwest and the weaponization of the desert against individuals. And before I get too much into it, I need to note that I, I am quite privileged. I am a migrant myself, but I am documented. And I come from the other US border, um, which affords a lot. Um, I also appear to be white. Um, I'm not Latinx. I don't even speak Spanish. And so the brutal realities of the things I'm going to talk about don't directly impact me. Um, but so that, that's not my story to tell. But my story today is looking at my apologies. Oops. Bear with me. Um, is is to tell you a little bit about how I've been looking into this. So here's us. We share a 2,000 mile border with Mexico, land border that is. And prior to 1994, not too long ago, about half of all of the undocumented migration that occurred into the United States occurred in these first 14 miles. So about half of all undocumented migration occurred in San Diego in San Diego County. Um, and so when people would enter into the US without documentation, at that time, they're in populated areas, you can get a bus, you can get a ride, you can get food and water, um, you can get resources. So it's fairly easy to cross and then um, get acclimated. In 1994, a national strategy was proposed by a US Border Patrol. And they aimed to curb this undocumented or irregular migration, as we call it, into the US from Mexico by two primary mechanisms. So this was during the um, Clinton administration. And there are two mechanisms. The first was to fortify the ports. So any of the ports of entry were to be fortified. And this meant um, agents, so physical beings, uh, physical barriers, technology, vehicles, anim animals, and really oodles of money. So much money has been, um, has gone through um, this entity of border control or border patrol. And so that was one way is to fortify that port. So the first 14 miles of, from the Pacific Ocean into San Diego, where almost half of people were crossing into America undocumented. Um, the second was to leave the desert areas wide open. So here is our beloved Anzo Borrego. And the strategy was to leave this open. And what the, the rationale was is that the environmental conditions were not conducive to entering. So there wouldn't be available resources. You can't catch a ride. You can't get water. You can't get food. And that this would be a deterrent. So migrants would not cross in these areas. Or if some did, word would get out that it's too difficult. There's no point in going and trying to get into the US here because it's, it's just too hard and you won't make it. And this was known as prevention through deterrence. So the deterrent being the hostile nature of the desert. And so I just wanna highlight a few points from this national strategy. 
The first is, and I'll just read this here, the prediction is that with traditional entry and smuggling routes disrupted, illegal traffic, that's people, will be deterred or forced over more hostile terrain, which is less suited for crossing and more suited for enforcement. The next is that illegal entrants, those are people, crossing through remote, uninhabited expanses of land will find themselves in mortal danger. And this last is that the most desperate of those aliens, aliens is another term for people, um, seeking entry will attempt illegal entry. So these three, po three small points from the national strategy tell us that the enforcers have an advantage, that undocumented people face mortal damage or mortar, mortal danger, and that the people who choose to um, enter into the US in this way are the most desperate people. They're the ones that have no choice. They really feel, or they really have no alternative to this. And so, Moving forward to 1997, this report um, was presented to Congress, and one of the things that was notable about this is that they noted that um, the results from this strategy, the national strategy, were inconclusive, and they said that they needed more time, more money, and more evaluation. Um, and one of the notes that was going to be an indication of if the strategy was working was that deaths may increase as enforcement in urban areas forces aliens, again, aliens are humans, to attempt mountain or desert crossings. So this is a recognition that these deaths were going to occur as a result of this strategy. So we know deaths will occur because of this strategy. Um, but it was said that they needed more data in order to be conclusive. Okay, we're going all the way forward to 2010. This is a um, Customs and Border Patrol report to Congress where they said, this policy has the unintended consequence of increasing the number of fatalities along the border as undocumented migrants attempt to cross over the inhospitable desert without adequate supplies of water. So there's a, a recognition that this policy has directly is, is directly leading to deaths. And this is in 2010. So that is 13 years ago that there is clear recognition that there's a link between policy and the deaths of undocumented people. And so if we look up the definition of state sanctioned violence, this is exactly what it is. This is the state um, implementing violence on a group um, because of a, a number of things, but because of documentation or um, legal illegal status. And I just want to note that this isn't new. This isn't something I'm, I'm talking about post 1994, but this isn't something that is new. Um, white supremacy and the creation of other um, are as American as apple pie, <laughs> maybe assault rifles, that's a joke, <laughs> sort of. Um, and so uh, I'll just say, this is me going down this rabbit hole learning about this just a little about, a little more than a year ago. Um, I really didn't have much knowledge about, I knew that there was a, a you know, humanitarian crisis, but I didn't have a lot of background about this. Um, and you may know what it's like when, you know, when, when something major happens in society that gets everybody really upset, like George Floyd or other events that are, that are massive and really impactful. Uh, there's something that I think of as punctuated outrage. It's like we go through our daily lives, everything's the same, the same. And then there's these things that happen. I mean, atrocities are happening all the time, but then sometimes it impacts you for whatever reason. You're the right, right time, right place, whatever it is. Um, and so for me, this is something that I, I wanted to dig into further. 
And so I started this with a really simple question. Um, I'm a scientist, and so I look at things from a scientific lens, and I just wanted to know how many people had died in California, um, on, either on soil or in waterways, as a result of these deterrent policies. Um, and this was more difficult than I would have thought to answer. The reason that this is important, um, this is Clyde Snow, who was a forensic anthropologist, and I'll read his quote. With ghoulish geniality, Clyde Snow liked to say that bones made good witnesses, never lying, never forgetting, and that a skeleton, no matter how old, could sketch the tale of a human life revealing how it had been lived, how long it had lasted, what traumas it had endured, and especially how it ended. Um, so, and uh, Clyde Snow was really instrumental in uncovering mass graves throughout the world um, in order to document crimes against humanity and um, genocides. So it is a matter of counting and simple arithmetic, but it's also um, understanding how many people are dying is, is important. Um, for bigger reasons. And I'll just note that counting the number of individuals is not the same as counting the number of people that have died, um, because we can never know how many people have actually died for, for a plethora of reasons. This is a picture of some experiments that were done using pig carcasses to see how long it would take for bodies to break down and what would happen to them. And in as little as six hours, a pig carcass can be rendered down to a couple of bones. So this can happen very quickly that, um, that individuals are dispersed naturally. Um, and other reasons, um, border patrol agents are sometimes told not to find bodies. So they may be told to avoid areas where they know individuals are. Um, and Sorry, I don't, I, I use a Mac and the mouse situation is weird for me. Okay, um, so the, yes, there are other reasons why um, bodies wouldn't necessarily be found. In Imperial County, sort of an aside, um, they will not count an individual unless there is a skull, a mandible, and a an complete vertebral column. So that's, an unusual definition, but it adds more to the problem, meaning that if you have something less than that, it's not counted as an individual. And so I found in the literature that there was one um, manuscript that looked at this question specifically, how deterrent policies impacted um, um, uh, undocumented migrants, specifically in California. And this data went up to 2005. And so between 94 and 2004, there were a total of documented deaths of 918. So 334 were in San Diego County and 584 Imperial County. Um, and so I just wanted to continue from there. We ha had a place, a base point, and I wanted to continue from there. And so the San Diego Medical Examiner, luckily, has this open data portal where they offer any information, information about deaths in San Diego County to anyone. And it dates back to 1997. There's about 77,000 lines in it. And so um, I used standard procedures just to go through this and find anyone that either is, was definitely a person that was um, migrating or using the International Organization for Migrations definitions that say you have to have greater than 50% likelihood that they were um, migrating. So, so it's not perfect. It's really difficult to um, determine whether or not someone was actually in the act of migrating, but if they are, say, um, found on a route that is known to be used by migrants, if they have are found um, in a in a desert area or in a really dry area without a lot of supplies, there are these indicators that suggest that it was likely a migrant. Um, in Imperial, the um, so we have a medical examiner in Imperial, they have a coroner and the coroner and the, sh the elected sheriff um, aren't interested in sharing their information. Um, so 
getting at this data was a little bit more tricky. And um, I essentially had to triangulate. So look at multiple sources without having official data um, to get at. And so here's what I found. Um, between 2005 and 2021, another 684 people at minimum um, died on our soil or in our waterways. And um, the total, that brings us up to 1,602. The total is actually a little bit higher because um, of people that have died since then now. And because this, one of my data sets actually goes back to 1993. So um, 1,826 people um, is how many have, we know of, have died in the desert since um, the installation of, of um, this deterrent policy. So what happens, um, people die of exposure. That's what we think of in the desert. It's been too hot, too cold, or been running out of water. A thing that we don't tend to think of is drowning. And if you've been into um, Calexico or areas around the All-American Canal, um, this is how people end up drowning in the desert. There's also vehicle accidents and um, actual border wall related injuries. And this has increased dramatically in the last two years because the wall was um, used to be 18 feet, it's been raised to 30 feet. And so that correlates with um, severe injuries and death. And I'll just note that um, this is the, the non-availability of this data or the, um, the non-willingness to share this information really acts to erase individuals. Um, so roughly 30% of people that are found that we think are migrants are never identified. And so they may exist in what we call a pauper grave. There's a large cemetery in Holtville um, that is dedicated to not just migrants, but to um, people that aren't identified or people that aren't claimed. But there's also, there was about a 16 year period where um, individuals that were thought to be migrants were cremated and, and buried at sea. And so there's no records, there's nothing publicly available. The individual, the remains were held for a minimum of one year and then scattered at sea. These people are erased. Like they are gone. Um, and I just, I got some data from the public administrator just last week. I was really excited to get it, as excited as one can get about, you know, this kind of data. And there are many whose bodies were buried in the National Cemetery or in Miramar. So these are veterans who were deported, attempting to enter America and are now buried in our national cemeteries. Okay, um, so there is currently a small hostile terrain exhibit in the Copley Library. So you may, has anybody seen this at the Museum of Us, this exhibit? Yeah, a few people have seen it, okay. This exhibit has been shown globally um, and the exhibit as is, is specific to Arizona. So um, what I did was take the data for California and adapt the exhibit to be specific to California. It's finished now. So this was a, it was participatory. So we worked on this together with groups of students. And um, so you can go see this. And I like to think that what we're looking at here is the orange tags are individuals that were never identified. The manila tags are people that were. And in San Diego, they are um, located according to the zip code where they were found. In Imperial, I don't have that information. And so it's a random distribution. Um, what I like to think that is that for those people that were erased, that they're a little bit less erased here, that we can see them even just a little bit, we can see a glimmer of them when we see this. Um, and last, I'm um, working with a group that is looking at death mapping of migrants from coast to coast. So the US-Mexico border and also the US-Canada um, border because people are tending to go to Canada to try and enter now. Um, and we aim to make this more um, visual and more openly available. They have a big grant, I don't, but I'm happy to be part of it. 
Thank you. Um, thank you to my colleague. Um, I, how can I start? Um, well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this, for inviting me to this talk. Uh, some of my students are here because this is the time that I teach. Um, I am Mexican and this border, uh, the dads in this border have been, uh, have touched me, my friends and my family in many ways. I have lived here since 1995, uh, one year after Operation Gatekeeper. And I, uh, on purpose, I studied migration and I worked at some point in the Mexican consulate in San Diego in, from 1996 to 2000. And we were actually in charge of documenting those deaths uh, because exactly what happened, the policies of the Terrans uh, pushing migration to the desert. Um, I would say that, I, I mean, I'm not in, position, in a position right now to dispute the numbers, but I will say that the numbers are way higher yeah. than that. Um, yes. But uh, let me just uh, start with um, what I was gonna bring today for the day. Also, I, I use a Mac and um, it's on the left side. Okay. I used to be able to, I, I was able to do this. It's not moving. Oh, that's moving. Okay, great. Okay, so I, this is a presentation from my experience as, uh, I mean, I, I migrated to the United States legally. I, I married a US citizen, and um, but many of my family members and friends have done that, that uh, crossing uh, through the, the, the desert, right? Uh, many people that I know. So I called it Landscapes of Fear and Hope, since the invitation uh, from Dr. Uh, Brian Clark was um, to talk about the la natural landscapes and the human meaning of the desert. Um, I was afraid of the desert. I still had this high, res I had to respect the desert. I had this uh, fear. <laughs> That's uh, one of the, one of the, um, the reasons I call it fear and hope. Uh, my first time in the desert was in uh, going down, uh, 1995, going down uh, to Anza Borrego. And I actually, I was driving and I was very excited to be there and I actually had a panic attack. Uh, and I couldn't dr continue driving. I had to ask my partner to take the, the wheel and con complete the trip. Um, I was really scared of the barrenness of the, the desert. I was really, really scared. Uh, this is the road. This is the very road where I got my, the panic attack, right? Mm -hmm. I was, um, let me explain you. Um, this is a line of uh, undocumented people walking through the desert. Uh, immigrants from Mexico, this image was very, was common. It started to become common at the time. People with the policies of the Terrans starting in 1994, people were crossing on, on the other side. Uh, there was no fence uh, when the desert acted as a fence for the Terrans. And these were very common images that I will see. I mean, that was part of my fear, right? Because I knew that the desert could be deadly and nobody was there to help you. Uh, this is hope, right? This is where I was born. <laughs> not there, not exactly there, but I was born in a very large city. I'm from Mexico City, Tenochtitlan. Um, it's about 22 million people. So I never really experienced, living in, in Mexico City, I never really experienced emptiness or being alone for a very long time. This is, this is your everyday life in Mexico City. This is, a, of course, this is a demonstration in La Plaza Central, Plaza de la Constitución, but it's very often you see a lot of people. Uh, this is my neighborhood. <laughs> this is where I, where I was born. Uh, it's about 1 million people. I know everybody, I, I swear. Uh, my, my husband always jokes, like, oh, 
uh, did you say hello to everybody in your neighborhood? Like, yeah, this is my neighborhood. This is in the outskirts of Mexico City. It's called Ciudad Nezahualcoyot. And that's where I was born. So as you could see, loneliness was not part of my everyday life before 1995. <laughs> So this is a rush hour. This is what I did every day for going to school. This is uh, Metro Pantitlan in rush hour. Uh, this is just a crosswalk in Bellas Artes in downtown Mexico City. And this is uh, La Linea Uno in the Metro. I took the Metro all the time. So that's common, right? So, I mean, if you're Chilango, that's how we call ourselves. Uh, you have a story about the Metro. Uh, many writers, writers in the city write about the metro and how physically possible it is that one more person always fits <laughs> inside a, a car. It, it's always physically possible. So that was my reality. And then, well, if you if you're afraid of people, you can try driving. It's not much different, right? So, uh, as you could see. Uh, that's why, right? I all those images about the desert being deadly, which is deadly, and feeling that oh my gosh, if the car if the car breaks down, we're gonna be here and nobody's gonna come. Or what if we find uh, somebody who is up to no good, right? We don't have anybody <laughs> to call. Uh, but then uh, this is this is the the road that I was driving uh, going down to El Saborrego. On this is this very territory, this very landscape is being fenced right now, right? It is, uh, and the fence, uh, probably you remember the past administration with Donald Trump when he promised that he was gonna build a wall and that was the main thing about his administration. The, the wall or the fence is already there. It started to be built as, as uh, Dr. Lefleur said in 1994. Um, I, I work at the Mexican consulate. Uh, actually, the, the fact that I work there is what brought me to study communication because I work in the, in the communications office and I would talk to journalists. And I had the fortune, right, of talking to journalists in the US side and the Mexican side. And something will happen, we'll have a press conference or something, and the stories will be completely different the next day, right? And I really wanted to understand that. Uh, there was a lot of uh, criminalization, right? We were always the criminals. Mexicans were always criminals. I got in my phone um, always hate messages, like, um, for example, beaters, go home, <laughs> right? You're not welcome, always. Yeah. So it was, it was common, right? So I really wanted to understand why the construction of the alienation, why we were aliens. I had an alien card. Right, which is my alien card was I was alien and my name. So I wanted to understand the human side of it and the narrative side of it. So that's why I I started um, a master's in communication and the, later my PhD. But what we did in the consulate and at the time was to uh, go to the radio and tell people from the south of Mexico and from Central America, which you see the landscape is very different. You saw Mexico City, right? The landscape uh, is not desert. Uh, Mexico has deserts in the north, but it's, it's less populated. So most of the migration were co was coming from the south or from the center where conditions of the desert are not common, right? We, people don't know uh, how to, is to walk in a desert and you need to hydrate, you need to, to drink water, or you will be dehydrated very quickly by the sun and without even feeling it, that you don't know when you don't live in the desert. So that was a message that we tried to convey to people. So especially, and they are still, I, I was looking at the uh, page from the Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores and they are still doing this just to warn people that it's not as easy and the desert can be deadly. Uh, they do in July and August. And those were usually, when I when I was working in the consulate, those were usually the deadliest months. Um, I remember 1997, um, there were at least 150 bodies found in the, between the desert and accidents in August. So 
Um, that was also another, started to be another common theme, right? A common uh, scene that the landscape was guarded, was being built up, was deterring people like me, right? Uh, who were coming from Latin America. And it, it, uh, it was surveilled by uh, the Border Patrol. By the way, the Border Patrol was created in 1924 as part of the Labor Department, Department of Labor. Uh, the initial purpose of the Border Patrol was to regulate labor because people coming from Mexico, especially, especially or from South America, Latin America, were considered labor. It was not part of the law of the, you know, national security. It became part of the national security after 9-11, just very recently. It used to be more uh, labor, regulate labor laws, right? So from Mexico, I remember um, I was doing my undergrad uh, in 1991, 1992, 1993. And this was the most uh, salient discourse, right, from the, the president at the time, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, who was the president of Mexico, President Bush from the U.S. It was that we were going to be partners with the United States, right, and we were going to be equal and we we're going to have progress, progress, and modernization are very common words among politicians in Latin America. We're going to be more modern and we're going to progress, right? And that was, that was the discourse in Mexico in 1994. So when I migrated here in 1995, what I found was the US was building that, that fence, right? Very rapidly. And like, what happened? Weren't we friends, right? And we were in some ways, right? Uh, the, 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 scenes, the scenes of fear, uh, what progress brought, right? Um, cheap labor, right? The, in some ways, the continuation of seeing Latin America and Mexico particularly as a source of labor, but the determination of the United States to stop it here, right? To, to divide, to create a zone um, stopping labor on the other side. So there are uh, maquiladoras, like this manufacturing factories along the border, the whole border starting from here, Tijuana, all the way to Matamoros. Um, this is what NAFTA, the, you know, being partners with the United States and Canada brought to Mexico. And there are some factors, you know, I made a point of uh, taking all the data. I usually lecture about this a lot and I have a lot of information, but I took it out. I wanted to make it more of a narrative, but there are some factors right, that um, the whole agreement with the United States created, created, uh, there is a, an increase of, uh, in the, of migration, and we call it push and pull factors, right? The economy gets integrated, there, are, there is demand for jobs in the places that have more money circulating, right? So, uh, and then, you lose the incentive of investing in some areas like agriculture. Mexico, you know, we have a lot of our creation stories come from corn and many people in the countryside stopped growing corn in the traditional way in the milpa and instead because uh, NAFTA brought a lot of cheap corn from Iowa into Mexico, right? And a lot of cheap corn into Oaxaca and into other places in Mexico. So there was not incentive from the government for um, uh, people growing corn to continue growing. So what happened? They ended up moving, you know, being uh, pulled because there was demand for, for labor in, in Iowa, in Central Valley, uh, cultivating different crops, right? So there is uh, another side of it, economic side of it. You have this consequences of the big policies, right? So yes, were they desperate? Uh, only desperate people migrate? Well, there are conditions that were created by eco the economy and the agreements and you know the macro structures that pull people into the United States and push people out of their territory in Mexico. So, and then Operation Gatekeeper, that was very important. That's, I, I always tell my students that's the very first fencing, like official fencing of the, of the border. Um, 
there was this growing interest in policing the border from the 1990s. This is, you know, Tijuana, San Diego, that's the um, Panamericana. Um, a gatekeeper in some ways uh, took effect. That was, that was a paradox, right? Uh, whereas in Mexico, we were saying, we're, we're going to be partners. Uh, we're going to have this great negotiation with our neighbor and the neighbor starts building this wall, right? Immediately. And they still tell you, well, we're negotiating, but I'm just building the wall because walls may do neighbors. That's a very <laughs> common phrase. And that was disconcerting, right? For me, uh, thinking about it, but it is, you know, at the same time, there is this, this negotiation of this huge agreement, creation of this big commercial zone in North America. Uh, there is the fencing of the, of the border. So it was depicted in the media as out of control, this area with criminals, you know, you know how, how, how expensive San Diego is becoming, right? Uh, at the time, this, so this area was depicted as, all the border areas were depicted as full of crime and, right, in the media. So that was, that was, the, that was the depiction. So um, I call it the simultaneous naftalization, right? The NAFTA, uh, North American Trade Agreement and militarization, everything happened at the same time, right? It was, I mean, being partners, was not going to preclude the United States from throwing more money into militarizing the border. So that's exactly what decided to happen, right? So uh, in, in some ways, uh, they did it to maximize the benefits of globalization while protecting against perceived de detriments or, or flows of people, which is, you know, we're going to be partners, we're going to create business together. Maybe you're going to offer some job openings there, and we're going to have job openings here. That didn't happen, right? Um, there was a lot of migration, but um, there was no, as you know, the legislation in the United States doesn't allow for easy migration from Mexico. So it is very difficult to be legal. So suddenly, a lot of Mexicans were illegal, right? And that's where that term comes from because it's impossible. You have to wait 20, 25 years, 30 years to be legal in the system, to work with the system. So if you have heard, oh, because they don't work with the system, they just wanna be illegal, that's why they cross through the desert. Uh, that's another story, right? So in reality, the border is, is not really a border because it's not an area of interaction, but a boundary, um, at least from the US side, a strict line of separation um, between two distinct territories. So this is a message, right? As a communication scholar, this is a message that the border communicates that the undesirables are on the other side. This is data, this is just um, how Americans talk about immigration. This is from Google Trends. It's not very recent, the data that I have, but it corresponds to, you know, to elections, um, I mean, talking about immigration is a very seek after um, way of winning elections, right? Uh, we call it moral entrepreneurs and moral panics. Uh, people, it's easy if people are not thinking about it, uh, it's easy to blame uh, people who are not like us, right? The foreigners, those people with funny accents that we don't like, it's easy to blame, to blame, to blame them. That happens in the UK, it's happening in Spain, it's happening in a lot of places. Um, so this is how, uh, I mean, we have been, a lot of activists have been trying to, to, tell, to convince media not to use the word illegal. And it was before the Trump administration, it was almost uh, widespread, understood that, that you know, the Associated Press and the New York Times were starting to change and covering Trump who said illegal every five seconds, just, uh, it just came back, right? So, and the, well, the, uh, Dr. Lefleur talked about the uh, white supremacy, right? The, the whole citizenship system in the United States is really rationalized, right? Um, it, if you were not a white person, in the United States, you couldn't have 
fully citizenship, right? So many people, uh, if you study the court cases, many people appeal to be citizens claiming that they were white, right? That's why, because it was a very rationalized system. So in the construction of Latin Americans and Latinos particularly coming from Mexico as the enemy has, has happened over decades, right? Over time, um, as you know, this is a magazine, this is US News from the 1980s. It depicts Mexico bleeding into this border, right? Into the United States, sort of uh, sending all these workers and bleeding into the United States. All those metaphors of invasion, right? But before the fence, before 1994, um, Mexicans didn't really want to stay here if they wanted, if they came to work. They, uh, a lot, I mean, a very big proportion of the migration was circular. They will go back, the men will come, and they'll go back to, to, to their communities. But when the border was created, it created an incentive to, to bring the children and to bring the, the women, right, into the, into the migratory network. So that, is, that also started to, to create. Um, now, I'll just wrap up with these. Um, Many people have forgotten Pete Wilson, but Pete Wilson was the governor of California. And to get reelected, he did, I mean, what did what Trump did was not that new. It's something that is kind of a very old formula that works, right? Pete Wilson wanted to be reelected and he made this calculus saying, well, um, especially Mexican immigrants don't vote because they are not naturalized, which was true at the time. A lot of Mexicans were not naturalized because of the proximity of Mexico. A lot of people thought, you know, I don't need to be a US citizen. And there was this calculus, right, that if they don't vote, I will just bash them and, and I'll win the election. I think he won. He, he got reelected. He passed, uh, he ran into uh, proposing this pro proposition 187, the nine basic services. And actually, Californians voted for it. It won, and it was reversed by a, by a, by a court, by the federal court. So I, I will, you know, most, uh, uh, there are about 46.2 million immigrants as uh, a year and a half ago, um, about 14% of the whole population, about 7.9 million are unauthorized immigrants uh, from Mexico and Central America. Um, and most, uh, I mean, you see, if there are no policies, if there are not, there is not a legislation to legalize Mexicans, you're gonna have a lot of Mexicans being uh, not documented, right? I don't really use the word illegal for many reasons. Um, well, uh, the US has been increasing the fencing since 1994, it has been increasing. And with Trump, there were some areas that were built up. Uh, apparently, Biden had to stop building the fence, uh, but he started again. Uh, he's finishing up some uh, areas in Yuma. Oh, I think I, it, uh, my Yuma photo didn't show up. But there were some uh, areas that were not finished, and they're, they went back to finish them in Yuma, Arizona, just east of San Diego County. Um, my hope, who builds walls, right? Apparently the, the world, the Western colonizer world, right, has been fencing. I mean, there are similar fences in Ceuta, Melilla, in Spain, in other places in the world. Uh, of course, Palestine and Israel, right? They have a lot of the technology that we use in this fence comes from Israel and, and and that, that area of the world. So uh, there is this building, but walls and, and, and fences also get outdated, right? Because things change and that's my hope. Uh, I wonder myself who builds walls, right? And there's, there are these fences very similar to the, they look very similar to how they look here. Same technology, same contractors, Israel, Palestine. Uh, the Berlin Wall was built, it, um, fell down, right? 1989, it was destroyed. And also the Chinese Great Wall. I mean, this is a good thing. 
Uh, so that's my hope that these scenarios will, uh, that there will be a moment when there will be, there will be no need. Uh, probably at this time we feel that, okay, it's inevitable. We have been building up these walls. We have been inundated with that rhetoric, but uh, things change, right? Uh, especially during the pandemic, um, a lot of Amer Americans are moving to Mexico. So maybe the migration will reverse, right? There are about a million. I mean, it, Mexico is a country that has the most Americans living there. A lot of them undocumented or illegal, if you prefer, uh, right? about a million and during the pandemic it grew. So maybe at some point we'll reconsider that wall, right? Maybe the wall will be detrimental for Americans to go to Mexico and live there. So that's my hope and that's my story. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna talk to you and then, okay. and then get up and how do I follow up uh, the image of Pete Wilson? I had forgotten about that. Uh, for those of you who remember Pete Wilson, back in 1994, uh, many people would say, um, it can possibly get any worse. And I, so I use this as an example. Yes, it can. It can get a lot worse than Pete Wilson, as time has proven. You, sorry to be so bleak. Anyway, um, so I'm gonna talk about the same things. My two colleagues, um, uh, we're on the same, on the same common denominator, uh, I'm gonna show you through, through images, through moving, moving pictures. <laughs> um, I'm gonna show you a clip of a documentary that I have been uh, working on. Um, before I do that, I wanna tell you very briefly how in the world I got here, because otherwise we, we may miss a few, a few steps. I'll be extremely brief, but I teach uh, literature, Latin American literature, and I got hired at USD in 2001 to teach um, you know, my area of expertise, although I hear we're mostly generalists, uh, has been Southern Cone uh, literature. So Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. And I have focused on dictatorial narratives and post-dictatorial narratives, memory, representation, trauma. Um, and ever since I came to uh, USD, I collaborated early on with uh, the Transborder Institute um, in all these different iterations. Um, and uh, with panels, with films, with um, conversations, presentations of, of different kinds. And, um, and so the border, has, since I came to San Diego, I became, I became aware of, of the meaning of the border here in San Diego, California. I had not paid a, lot of, a, a whole lot of attention to it, to be perfectly frank, before that. So this happened, this interest started here in San Diego. Um, in um, photography for me has been a, has been a, has always been a hobby and it's a place where I it's, it's what I do in my free time you know and um, around 2008 I sort of decided to to kind of get a get more control of my photography to see if I could do something else I started taking classes I went through the usual uh, took the usual steps um, learning how to make make at least a photograph with a straight with a straight horizon, you know, um, something that maybe was in focus this time for a change, you know, uh, and it was a big transition going from going from film to digital at the time when I when I finally decided to take uh, control. Long story, very short. Uh, by 2012, I decided to take a kind of a wild step, and I began to call myself a photographer. And um, this was after my uh, photography teacher, a former Marine combat correspondent, left San Diego after taking classes with him for four years. And I asked him, and I said, "Hey, do uh, you think I can? Do you think I can? I can make a living out of this?" He said, "Sure, you can." He gave me some tips. I opened up a, a studio. This is while I while I kept my day job. Well, uh, you were I think you were not associate dean, <laughs> and. Uh, and I started making family photos, uh, you know, weddings, baptisms, uh, engagements, so many things. So that's how I sort of, um, I sort of entered the world of photography um, and just doing commercial stuff and just trying to see if I could, if I could actually um, have a second form of income in addition to my professor's salary. 
Um, at one point in time, by 2000 and, and, uh, 2014 or so, for 2015, so I had to make a decision whether I was going to keep my day job or not. And by just by some chance, I began to photograph writers. I made a, a photo of a writer here, a photo of a writer there. Uh, then a Colombian magazine hired me to do some photos for some special uh, section on Latin American new trends. Uh, I don't remember what it was. And so I started doing uh, commissions. And so these commissions led me to do more writer portraits. And then I began to sell some of these photos to some of the publishers. And so I started to shift away from doing the photos of the cute family for Christmas and the holidays and moved on to just doing portraits of, of writers. And so I, I began to find a way to maybe keep both of my jobs, so to speak, at least I hope that I don't get fired now after I leave this. Um, but, um, and uh, the, around 2016, Transborder Institute asked me to become a fellow and I thought, and I told them, why are you inviting me to be a fellow? Because I'm not technically a quote, quote Mexicanist. I'm not a Mexican studies specialist. And they said, we know that. That's why we want you to become a fellow. We want a fresh perspective. And so they asked me the one condition that I had to present a, um, I had to present a, um, a research project on the US-Mexico border. And at the time I was, I went to teach abroad in Argentina where I'm originally from. And I kept watching uh, the images of a uh, presidential candidate who nobody thought could win, saying horrible things about migrants crossing the border. And I thought, I gotta, I, there's, there's, I have to do something with this. And so I proposed when I came back to do a sort of cartography of, um, you know, a photographic cartography of writing on the US-Mexico border. So who's who basically? The border is this, really um, special um, space, you know? It's, it's almost neither here nor there, and at the same time, it's both. This is often referred to as a, as a third space. I mean, if you talk about writing on, on, along the border to say, uh, to, if you give a, a talk in, say, Guadalajara, or you know, Mexico's sec second largest city, or Mexico City, um, a lot of people don't pay any attention or know who's writing along this side. And so it becomes sort of like a periphery, both to the, it's a periphery to Mexico and it's a periphery to the US. Wrapping up, and let me get to the clip. I, um, I started traveling, making some of these portraits. Um, and um, I found subgenres that interest me. At the same time, I had been commissioned by the National Library in Argentina to do a catalog on crime fiction writers, uh, which is something that has, has really taken hold lately in Latin American fiction. Uh, crime fiction as a sort of fertile ground to tell, to tell some pretty important uh, stories. Um, and so I found traveling along the US-Mexico border that there was quite, quite a few uh, crime fiction writers here as well. So I, I started a conversation with a filmmaker and producer, Isaac Artenstein, and we decided to collaborate on a documentary that we uh, have titled Border Noir, and in which we try to tell the story of, um, of writing uh, crime fiction on the US-Mexico US border. The desert is always thought of as a place, I mean, the desert is an arid place, climate-wise, but something that I've been trying to do through my photography and now through this documentary is to show that there is more to it than meets the eye. In that space, uh, there's a vibrant, um, rich uh, cultural life that is anything but uh, arid. So these are some of the things we're trying to do with this uh, film. And I need my glasses because I'm at that stage in my life where uh, even with my contact lenses, I can see. So, um... Thank mm -hmm. you.